you for uh, overly generous uh, introduction. So I'm very happy to be back to GGI, uh, even if virtually, and uh, meet all of you. Uh, so the title of my talk is Tangle to Narnier. And uh, there are two reasons for this title. Uh, one is that uh, this has something to do with uh, the second half of my talk today. And another is that I learned that uh, actually the Narnier is after uh, an Italian town about 200 kilometers south of uh, Florence uh, between Azizi and Rome uh, in Umbria. Uh, C.S. Lewis uh, learned about the name of the town when he was a child and uh, decided to name his uh, 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 imaginary country uh, uh, after this town. So, so I thought that was good for the occasion. So, so this work is uh, uh, based on work in progress with Nathan Benjamin, uh, Christoph Keller, and Ida Zeder. And I hope uh, uh, it will appear uh, in next month, but we'll see how it goes. It's still, there are some parts are still work in progress, as you will see. And, uh, but uh, we are, I'm very excited about this work. So I thought that uh, I'd like to take this occasion to tell you about this work. So, so holography, has been an important theme of uh, a formal part of uh, high energy physics, string theory, and quantum gravity for over the past couple of decades. And uh, uh, so we're just talking about the Galileo Galileo Medal. And uh, two years ago, Juan Maldonado Senna was the first recipient of the medal. And uh, uh, it was his contribution that uh, the, uh, to show that the holography actually get realized in the context of string theory. So recently, uh, a new type of holographic pairs uh, has been found, and uh, uh, it's very interesting. So rather than having one fixed uh, quantum system dual to one gravitational system, uh, in this dual pair, uh, they found that you have actually random ensemble of quantum mechanical system. And that turned out to be dual to a relatively simple uh, gravitational theory in bulk. So this was first found uh, by us, uh, Saad Schenker and Stanford in the context of duality between one dimensional quantum system, which is no space, but just one time, and uh, a string theory in approximately uh, ADS2, two dimensional space. And then uh, last year, there were a couple of uh, paper appears where this is a similar thing was discovered for two dimensional conformal field theory. They considered some ensemble of two dimensional conformal field theory that I will tell you about. And they found that they have a very simple gravitational dual. So, so uh, today I will mostly uh, focusing on generalization of uh, this uh, two-dimensional uh, quantum system dual to three-dimensional gravitational system. So this discovery has revived the question on the role of wormhole in quantum gravity and the implication of these wormholes to the holography. So wormhole has been both uh, a sort of a puzzling for many years, Sidney Coleman made a very interesting observation that it generates some kind of a, a random process in the uh, gravitational system. And, uh, but it was also, uh, Mardosen and Maut pointed out that if it happens in the context of ADHD FD correspondence, then it's very puzzling. Because uh, for example, we already know that uh, in higher dimension, like for example, eight, uh, uh, N equal four super Yamil theory being dual to string theory in ADS5 times S5 doesn't involve any uh, ensemble average of Yamil theory. One could have considered average of uh, over, for example, coupling constant, which is uh, which does not run in the case of N equal four super Yamil, but it doesn't happen. So, in some situation, wormhole seems to generate uh, random uh, averaging. And in some situation, it does not. And uh, so what is a rule? What, what does wormhole does for quantum gravity? Somehow, this uh, uh, a new uh, a discovery of new, a new class of uh, uh, holographic pair may have something to say about this. So, so, so I'm very interested in uh, uh, understanding uh, this new type of uh, duality. But so far, uh, there is no fundamental explanation for emergence of uh, uh, gravity from this type of ensemble average. This is in contrast to the case of uh, a traditional ADS CFT correspondence, where many of them have actually a top down derivation. Of course, a famous one is the first example that Juan Marcos Senna found the duality between n equal four super mirrors in four dimension and type 2b string in ADS5 cross S5. 
There, he started out with, with well-established construction of these three brains and uh, the degrees of freedom on these three brains and took a particular limit in both gravitational description and gauge theory description of these three brains and found the correspondence that uh, the ADS CFT. Uh, as far as I know, uh, there is no such derivation of uh, these new type of dualities. So we need to find the rules. So I would like to know how does it happen? When does it happen? And does it happen in higher dimensions? So for example, there are examples uh, in equal force parameters, as I have been saying a few times already, where uh, uh, we know that uh, such uh, uh, ensemble average does not emerge. So, so what's going on? So, so that is sort of uh, uh, my motivation. Okay, so, uh, so I, I was not sure what kind of level of audience I should look at. In US, when we say colloquium, uh, it's meant to be for general uh, physics uh, audience, including uh, graduate student. But from by looking at the past talks uh, and also the list of organizers, it seems like I can use some equations. So I'm going to use some equation if we, it, uh, I'm allowed to do. So first, in the first slide here, uh, I'm actually uh, uh, summarizing the uh, calculation that was done by these people, this set of people. So uh, Afghani, Jedi, and the collaborator, and Maroni, and Witten last June. So they consider the following conformal field theory, very simple conformal field theory, which is a, a free two-dimensional conformal field theory, it consisting of just free scalar field uh, with target space being torus. So it's a free conformal field theory. So it was shown by Narayan that uh, it's parameterized by uh, the uh, uh, lattice, uh, which describes the torus. And the lattice is uh, parameterized by this coset space, OCC. So I forgot to write that uh, the target space, oh, here it is, is a, is a C-dimensional torus. I, wrote, I use C to describe the dimension of the torus because she is going to be the conformal uh, central charge of, of this conformal field theory. So he showed that uh, uh, this type of conformal field theory is classified by a point in this coset space. It's called Narayan moduli space. And uh, it's a, 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 a self dual lattice of signature C comma C. And for, for each lattice, there is a, a fixed metric and B field in the target space torus. The passion function of this conformal field theory is very simple. So, so you have uh, C uh, free boson, so target space is C dimensional. So you, you have this uh, eta function, eta inverse of eta function, and then sum over momentum and the winding number. And Q is uh, exponential of two pi i, and uh, this is the standard passion function in the toroidal compactification. Is so what is function the Dedekind function? This is a Dedekind eta function. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I still get. Uh, nice, nice to hear your talk. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So, so now we're gonna. Uh, uh, so they, they they decided to average uh, 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 this partial function over moduli space uh, of this torus and Narayan moduli space. And uh, measure is very well defined because uh, you have a zamorozhikov metric in conformal field theory for marginal perturbation. So, so you can average this partial function. And they discovered the beautiful formula, which goes back to Siegel and uh, some mathematician in the middle of the uh, 20th century. And uh, they found that it's actually given by inverse of eta function, the kind eta function, summed over uh, images uh, of SL2z over z. Okay. So it must mean something. So they found an interpretation. They found that uh, this has, the right hand side has an interpretation as gravitational partial function. So, so this is a formula that they found, the average of uh, Narayan uh, uh, conformal field theory over Narayan moduli space is given by sum over inverse of Dedekind eta function. So this uh, inverse of Dedekind eta function raised to the power of 2c has an interpretation of partial function of Chan-Simon gauge theory, whose gauge group is U1c times U1 to the c. They identified this gauge group because that's a, a, a symmetry of this conformal field theory. So if you have a conformal field, free conformal field theory with C gauge boson, free, free C free, uh, scalar field, 
Then there is a, you want to the C for the left mover and you want to the C for the right mover. So if you have C of them, you have, you have this many symmetry. So, so if you consider a solid torus whose boundary is, is two dimensional torus, then the passion function is given by this. So then you can interpret the sum over images of SL2Z Z over Z as just sum over different way of filling torus to make solid torus. Because there are various different markings that you can make on the boundary torus. And so, so you can interpret it as sum over hyperbolic geometry with genus one boundary. So this is interesting because on the left side, you have a passion function of conformal field theory in two dimension. So you can think of this as passion function on two dimensional tor torus, genus one surface. And what they found is that if you average passion function over torus, then you get some over partial function of some topological system inside of the torus, three-dimensional solid tori, and then you have some over possible way to do the filling in such a way that uh, you can define hyperbolic geometry inside. So now, so they, they came to the following sort of slogan, the, the correspondence, namely, if you have conformal field theory whose target space is C-dimensional torus, and if you average that over moduli space of such conformal field theory, then it is equivalent to the Chan Simon theory with uh, 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 this symmetry and the tensor with some topological gravity. And the purpose of the life of this topological gravity is simply sum over hyperbolic geometry. You need to couple to this topological gravity because uh, if you have just Chan Simon theory, there is no motivation for summing over this topology or geometry. You just have this partition function. But they discover that it's not just one partition function, it's actually sum over partition function, sum over possible way to fill the bulk. So that must be gravitational. So they found this correspondence that average of this uh, conformal field theory is equal to topological field theory coupled to topological gravity. So this is more as uh, all the evidence they found. They also generalized it to a higher genus surfaces. There are some puzzles about this. I do not want to elaborate, but uh, I'd be happy to discuss if you have a question on that. Uh, but my interest is uh, to generalize on the left side, namely that this is just one data point, one example. So, so it'd be nice to understand whether this something like that happened in other conformal field theory. And what are the patterns? When it happens, what kind of things you got on the right-hand side does it always happen or it happens only in some example? Obviously, there are many other examples of conformal field theory with moduli space called conformal manifold, a family of conformal field theory. So for example, rather than target space being torus, one could consider orbifold and orbifold may change its shape continuously. So you can average over orbifold. More ambitiously, you, can you may also consider Carabial manifold. Carabial manifold come with moduli. So you can consider two dimensional conformal field theory, which is a sigma model whose target space is K3 surface or Carabial manifold. And consider observable passion function, correlation function, and average them over moduli space and see what you get. In fact, uh, you can also consider rational conformal field theory, C less than one minimal model, for example. So there, uh, you can also ask, well, there are, for actually for given central charge, there are situations where there are several rational conformal field theory. So you may consider averaging them. And you can ask, well, does it have any interpretation? So, so I would like to uh, discuss uh, these examples. Okay, a are any questions so far? You are uh, looking all the time at cases in which there are really no uh, no uh, real uh, graviton degrees of freedom. Is it important? I do not know. So, so, so that's why I said for well, a uh, general pattern. So in three-dimensional gravi uh, gravity, Einstein gravity, you, there are no gravitons. So uh, if I rephrase your question slightly differently, you can ask whether there are examples in higher dimensions. Yeah. And uh, I have something to say about that towards the end of my talk. Okay. So uh, please hold your question until then. 
Okay, so let me move on. So, so that's so, so thank you for asking because that was one of my motivation. So, when we say gravitational theory, what kind of gravitational theory would show up in this kind of ensemble others? Can it propagate, for example? And so, and, so, and I, so, the so far there was no. Hiroshi, no only Hiroshi, and if the duality is to string theory, so what does it mean really to average? That's my question. So, so the only, there are only two data points so far. The work by Sal Schenker Stanford uh -huh. and the work by these two sets of people. And uh, there are only two data points. So it'd be good to know because there is no fundamental derivation of this yet. So, so one possible approach is to come up with more examples and see whether there are any patterns or not. Okay, so that's what I would like to do. So first I would like to repeat this exercise. So, so it's gonna be relatively simple. So it's why I would like to repeat this exercise in the case of orbifold. So we can, I'm gonna discuss various different orbifolds, Z2, Z3, Z4, Z6, but Z2 is the simplest case. So let me spend quite a bit of time on describing it. So, the, so the, the obvious idea is that rather than averaging torus partial function of target space torus, we can consider averaging partial function of a uh, uh, conformal field theory whose target space is orbit. So that is very well known from the 80s. So it's actually given by one half of the partial function in the case of torus, plus contribution from twisted sector, which is given by this ratio of theta function and eta function. Uh, ensemble average is very trivial because uh, uh, this uh, gentleman uh, uh, last year uh, already calculated this. So, so, so we, I don't, we, don't, we didn't have to do any work. And this is actually independent of the moduli. So, so it just fell out, come out like that. So then the question is that, can you write it in any meaningful way as gravitational partial function in three dimension? So that's what uh, uh, one may consider doing. So one thing to know is first to guess what the uh, three dimensional bulk topological system is. If you didn't do the orbifold, you'd have gotten Chan Simon theory. So the orbifoldizing mean, mean that on the boundary you have global symmetry and you gauge it global symmetry. Uh, before you uh, consider orbifold, the bulk theory is a Chan Simon theory. So if you have Chan Simon theory, it also have global symmetry. It is funny because uh, uh, Daniel Haro and I proved two years ago that in the context of ADS-CFT correspondence, gra uh, gravity side does not have global symmetry. But our derivation applies only in the case when the gravitational system has Einstein gravity description with black hole in it. So, so Chan-Simon theory does not have such feature. So it's okay for Chan-Simon theory to have global symmetry. And indeed it has the two global symmetry flipping the sign of the connection in the A called zero gauge, for example. So you can consider gauging this symmetry and then one can naturally conjecture that average of Z2 orbifold of torus correspond to Chan-Simon theory gauged by Z2 and then coupled to topological gravity. Okay, so the obvious guess is that uh, the partial function is given by the Z2 projection of Chan-Simon partial function on the solid torus and then some over solid torus. But you can easily check that this does not work. So, so you could, so, so, so here what I'm doing is that projecting, since we are gauging with this symmetry, so we are projecting onto Z2 invariant state by adding this sector. But it turns out that this formula does not work. So what should we do? So one thing we learned from uh, early work in uh, to, uh, uh, work in early to the 1990s that if you have discrete group gauge symmetry, so now we are gauging Z2 symmetry, one thing you get is a vortex. One, one, you get the vortices associated to a discrete symmetry, which is that this object, co-dimension two object, around which you have uh, uh, operation of uh, this uh, discrete group symmetry. So you have to actually sum over vortices. So we have to take into account the effect due to vortex. So in the solid torus, you can have Z2 vortex going around it. So what it does is that, so this uh, red curve is a Z2 vortex. 
So if you go around G2 vortex, the gauge field changes sign. So it turns out that this generates uh, uh, these terms. And uh, so these additional contributions coming come from this Z2 vortex contribution. And if you sum over all possible way to include the uh, uh, solid, uh, sum over all possible topology of solid torus, then indeed this, this equality holds. So it turns out it, it seems like the partition function uh, at the level of partition function, this correspondence actually works. So this is a positive case. Check. Now, for the purpose of later discussion, I would also like to point out uh, that there is another way to think about this, which is a following. So this conformal field theory, whose target space is a, a, a Z2 or before, has a smaller chiral algebra. So previously, you had U1 to the C on the left side, left mover, and U1 to the C for the right mover. But now we, we are gauging Z2 symmetry, so chiral algebra becomes smaller because some of the chiral algebra breaks Z2 symmetry. So you can consider decomposing this uh, uh, overworld partial function into representation of this uh, new chiral algebra. And then you find that uh, there is a vacuum representation. And then there are three representations of this chiral algebra, which does not dep depend on the moduli. And then there are infinitely many sequence of uh, representation, which depends on the Narayan moduli of this orbital. You can actually also write this correspondence as saying that uh, the average of Narayan partial function is sum over uh, uh, image, uh, image of SL2z over z uh, of this uh, modular independent part of the partial function. So this is sort of another interpretation of the same equation. So we found that this generalizes to other orbifold, but in some, uh, some cases that we do not average over entire Narayan moduli because the sum of the moduli direction get, get frozen. For example, in the case of Z3, Z4, Z6. So in, the, in general, uh, if you look at the Narayan, uh, if you pick a particular point in Narayan moduli space, there are various directions that you can go in Narayan moduli space. Some direction correspond to Kera deformation. Some direction corresponds correspond to complex structure deformation. So if you consider this type of orbifold, deformation in complex moduli direction get frozen. So it's just on the average of a Kera direction. And interestingly, if you do this correct averaging, then something like, like this again works perfectly. So you just consider gauging over ZP symmetry. And then you obtain here a uh, Chan Simon theory uh, with uh, a, a projection uh, of, of a Z2 gauge group. Okay, so this seems to work very nicely. So how about correlation function? So we have only been talking about Pachung function. So you can ask, would, the would this work for correlation function? There is a reason that uh, uh, these people, uh, Afkani, uh, Jedi, and the collaborator, and Maroni and Witten, there is a reason that they did not consider Pachung function because in the case of uh, Torah's target space, there is no interesting uh, correspondence because uh, of course, torus has uh, lots of uh, vertex, uh, torus conformal field theory has lots of vertex operators, but most of them has conformal dimension, which depends on the moduli. Only moduli independent operator is identity. So the correlation function of identity is trivial. It's actually the same as function function. So that's what, and, and then, in fact, uh, you can check that uh, the, the correspondence does not work for uh, 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 other operators. And perhaps because, uh, there is no bulk states that correspond to uh, momentum and winding, non-zero momentum and winding states. So, so, so in, in that case, actually, there are no interesting correlation functions to check. But in the case of uh, uh, torus, uh, so or before, TC over Z2, there are interesting correspondence because you have twist field, twist operators. So for example, in Z2 or before, you have two-dimensional conformal field series. So this is the worksheet of the conformal field theory. And then you can put twist operator. And as you go around the twist operator, you get the Z2 action. In this case, the minus sign. And uh, so, so you have a, a, a twist operator for uh, uh, all before. So you can consider correlation function. This twist operator is parameterized by fixed point under Z2 action. And in the case of C-dimensional torus, you have two to the C 
fixed point. That's easy to see because uh, for uh, Z2, uh, flips the sign of the uh, every coordinate on torus. And for each coordinate direction, suppose uh, you normalize the radius of the circle to be one, then there is a fixed point at zero because minus zero is zero. And also one half is a fixed point because if you flip the sign of one half, it's minus one half, but modulo one because it's circle of radius, uh, circumference one. So, so therefore minus one half is the same as one half. So there are two fixed points in each direction. There are C directions, so you have two to the C fixed point. So twist operators is parameterized, twist operators uh, of this conformal field theory is parameterized by two to the C uh, uh, vector. So this is uh, given by this. So you can consider correlation function. There is a charge conservation, so you have to satisfy this. So we can actually compute average of this. So if you average this, it turns out that these are non-zero only when these are pairwisely identified. These fixed points are pairwisely identified. So, so we can calculate, for example, something like that. You can calculate the pairwise identified twist operator here and, three, and then you can call the four-point function. So it's conformal field theory. So four-point function depends on the unharmonic ratio of the four-point. And you can average that over Narayan moduli space. Interestingly, the result of average is a non-holomorphic Eisenstein series of gamma two, which is a congruent subgroup of SL2Z. So it's a gamma two over Z, sum of a gamma two over C of this uh, one over eta to the two C. Gamma two is a congruent subgroup of SL2C, which basically means that diagonal elements are odd and off diagonal elements are even. So now you want to interpret uh, this. So how, how can you interpret it? May so in fact, uh, there, is a, there is a beautiful mathematics associated to it. May I ask a question? Yes, please. If you take C equal to one, okay? Yes. So simple about, does this mean that you can take as, a, a, not a, a torus as a surface, but a deeper elliptic surface? Because if you are put, putting cuts with just C equal to one, it is a, like, as if you are considering a higher, hyper, hyperlytic functions. Sorry, uh, I, I, I'm not quite sure I, I, I follow. So you are concerned, you want to ask me to, you're asking me about C equal one case. Yeah, C equal one. But yeah, C equal one is a little bit delicate because uh, for sufficiently small C, sometimes this does not converge. But I don't remember whether it converges at C equal one. But anyway, I, it seemed like your question was in different direction. So yes, uh, 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 repeat the question. Essentially, the, the point that you are inserting uh, twist uh, fields means that you are inserting some cuts in, uh, in the surface. That's correct. So, when you insert two, uh, two uh, couples, it means that you are going to a, to a different surface from a torus. You are gluing a, a, to a torus on, along the two cuts. So, you are go it seems that you are going on a hyperlytic function of, of, as a target space. Exactly. So that's one of the reasons why you get this eta function. So, okay, that's, that's it. Okay, thanks. Yes. So, so this was actually, thank you for raising this because this is an interesting point. So in fact, so uh, as he pointed out, Igor pointed out, if you insert twist operator, it creates a branch cut. So you, so as a natural way to describe it is as you go around it, you get to the different sheet. So that's naturally considered a sort of uh, 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 lead, lead us to consider covering of this space. So then you can ask, well, what is a bulk interpretation of this in, uh, procedure? So this will take us to Narnia. So, so that's a sort of a good way to segue to go into my next discussion. So we want to uh, have interpretation of this in the bulk. So it turns out that, so, so we want to understand the right-hand side as, as some three-dimensional object. And three-dimensional objects we will see are rational tangles. So I would like to explain what rational tangle is. But before we go into that, I'd like to uh, explain the relation between the uh, sum over gamma two and monodromy in the space of uh, a harmonic ratio of three, uh, four points. So, 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 so this, is, uh, this is the following thing. So, so here you might have asked, well, here, I, I wrote this unharmonic ratio x. But on the right-hand side here, you have torus tau. 
So I didn't tell you what the relation between tau and x is. So this is uh, the famous uh, 19th century mathematics uh, 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 discovered by, I think, Abel and also the uh, Jacobi. So the relation between the uh, a branched cover of sphere and the torus. And the relation between x and tau is given by what's called lambda function, the ratio of theta function. And its inverse is given by the ratio of hypergeometric function. So you can read it in any of the complex analysis textbooks. And if you look at this, uh, 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 one of the features of a hypergeometric function is that it has a beautiful monodromy property. As x goes around zero and one, uh, it transforms uh, into linear combination of these hypergeometric functions. And you can show that if, you, if this x goes around zero and one, it generates the monodromy uh, action on this ratio of hypergeometric function, which is exactly t, t square or s t square s, of which are generator of gamma two, uh, where t and t s, t and s are generator of SL two z, where t corresponds to tau goes to tau plus one, and s corresponds to tau goes to minus one over tau. And so t square and s t square s generate gamma two. So you can see that there is a correspondence between monodromy in the uh, four point on, on sphere and the gamma two action on torus. So that's one thing to remember. And the other is a notion of tangles. So I'd like to explain uh, what I mean by tango in this context. In the context of the physical theory we are discussing, tangles are nothing but Z2 vortices. So, so as uh, Igor asked, if I put these four point on sphere, so this is meant to be sphere, it look like a plate, but this is sphere. And I, I have two points, I have four points, and I put uh, a, a, a twist operator. There are two types of twist operators, epsilon and epsilon prime. So I put epsilon in red and epsilon prime on right, uh, in, uh, in blue. And uh, in the bulk, it turns out, so it turns out that these are actually natural endpoint of Z2 vortices. So, so because uh, remember the, the purpose of Z2 vertex is that to give you minus sign as A goes mi to minus A. It's actually, if you go to the boundary, it naturally go to the Z2 action on the uh, 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 conformal field theory variable. So Z2 vertex naturally end on the uh, uh, twist operator. So it extends out. So natural thing is to glue them together. Now, what happens if you do the monodromy transformation of the X? Well, so they start tangled with each other. So, so, for, so this is what uh, I, 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 I'm drawing. So suppose you have this trivial configuration where you, uh, uh, this, uh, 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 you have this op uh, twist operator and from there emanate the vertex and its end on the other side. And here it's the same. Now if you uh, move X around one, the, 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 you, you generate tangles. So, so that, therefore you can interpret and uh, you can actually, so this, by the way, so, so the, the, these are called rational tangles. So these are special class of tangles as I'm going to show. Uh, so for example, so here is an example of tangles that you can generate by monodromy transformation on X. But there are also tangles which cannot be generated by monodromy transformation. For example, here's an example. You cannot, gen uh, you cannot generate this kind of tangles by doing monodromy transformation on this type of configuration. So these are called rational tangles and these are called non-rational tangles. So this uh, notion was introduced by John Conway who unfortunately passed away last year. The, uh, his, uh, his aim was to use this to classify knots. He regarded as a, a rational tangle as building blocks of knots. And he found very, very various nice observation about the rational tangle, including its correspondence to continued fractions. So anyway, so as I said, uh, uh, there is a since there is a correspondence between monodromy of X and the gamma two, the congruent subgroup. So you can actually show that uh, this summation can be regarded as some over configuration of Z2 vortices in the configuration of rational tangles. So you can think of this as some of our rational tangles. So why 
on Earth, we are just summing over rational tangles and not over this kind of thing, rational, irrational tangles, non-rational tangles. This has something to do with a special feature of geometry. So you can ask what distinguishes this ge uh, geometry to this geometry. So as Igor said, on the boundary, if you go around each of these twist points, you go to a new seat. So, so in the bulk, you can also consider a corresponding geometry where you go around this Z2 vortex and you go to another sheet or another three-dimensional geometry. And you can ask uh, what kind of three-dimensional geometry you can get by considering this tangle configuration. So it turns out that this was actually very well studied by mathematicians and uh, uh, Bill Thurston is, was one of them. And in fact, uh, there is a beautiful video of, of uh, his presentation of the idea. It's about uh, a nine minutes video, but uh, I only have uh, 20 minutes. So I only show, I'm gonna show you first two minutes of the video, which is actually relevant for the purpose of this presentation. So let me uh, uh, show you his video. Can you see uh, this uh, YouTube page? Okay, so let me turn it on. So this is uh, uh, William Thurston, uh, the famous uh, uh, geometry and topologist. Uh, uh, made a fundamental contribution for, uh, to uh, three-dimensional geometry and led to, for example, a uh, uh, proof of Poincaré conjecture. So, so let me show you the first two minutes of this talk. I want to take you through a little exercise of the imagination that will help understand and distinguish different kinds of knots. So we're going to begin with the most ordinary knot of all, the unknot. Here's a, here's a unknot in the form of a um, a loop of tubing, but what you may not realize right away is that this tubing has magical properties. It creates a singularity in the fabric of the universe. And, and what it does is that as you, if you look through the tubing, the universe you see through the tubing gradually drifts away from the universe on this side of the tubing. Um, and over many years, its properties and its occupants change a lot. That world through the tubing is called Narnia. Um, I can step through this magical loop, like a doorway, into another world, the world Narnia. Here we are in Narnia. We've been exploring, we've had lots of adventures and seen many unusual and interesting sights, but um, we've arrived finally back at the um, at this coil, this unknotted coil. And when we look through it again, we see Earth. I'm kind of tired of being in Narnia, so I'm going to step through the coil and I'm back in Earth again. This tubing creates a two way branching in the universe. When I go through it once, I, I go from Earth to Narnia. If I go through it, Again, I go from Narnia back to Earth. I can keep going as many times as I want from Earth to Narnia. And it doesn't matter which direction I go through. I went from Earth to Narnia. Here I'm in Narnia and I can step back out and I'm in Earth again and so forth. This is the property of the tubing. But the tubing doesn't have to be just arranged as an ordinary kind of unknotted door. What happens if you knot the tubing? Will it create the same kind of split in the universe or will it create a different kind of split? Well, let's try and find out. Okay, so, so for the rest of the talk, uh, uh, Bill Thurston explains how the uh, same uh, uh, construction works for, for this track one. It's a beautiful presentation. So, so if you have time, uh, I recommend you to uh, go to this YouTube page and uh, it's, uh, it's nine minutes in total. It's worth your nine minutes of your life. And uh, so, so can you see my slide now? Good. So, 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 so then it seemed like uh, uh, what uh, uh, Thurston was telling us is that for each configuration of knot, you can consider double, co double branched covering over knot and it's create a new geometry. So he was showing how it works for unknot. 
And in the reminder of his video, he considered trefoil. And then he actually discussed, described exactly what kind of three-dimensional geometry you get. It's a beautiful presentation he does. So that was a case for knot, but you can also do the same thing for tangles. So in that case, rather than considering geometry, closed geometry, you have three-dimensional geometry with boundary, which is a, 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 a torus in this case. So, so, so th therefore, for each tangle configuration, you get uh, three-dimensional geometry uh, whose boundary is torus. So the question is that, uh, well, what kind of geometry would you get? by going to Narnia and Earth and Narnia and Earth for this rational tangle and the non-rational tangle. Mathematician has an answer to this question. So I look, we look through this when we're working on it. There's a beautiful paper by Hogson and Rubinstein in 80, 19, uh, 1985. Uh, this apparently solved the very fundamental problems in knot theory and three-dimensional topology. But there is a lemma in this paper where they show that the double branch cover of a two tangle, which is like two pair of this tangle, is a solid torus if and only if the tangle is rational. So that's a distinguished feature, namely that if you consider the earth now near, the earth now near, and uh, consider a double branched covering of this rational tangle, you get solid torus. But here you get some other geometry which is bounded by torus. Okay? So that's an important point. And then, then it came to our mind that it was actually already proven by uh, uh, Maroni and Witten in 2007. Uh, evidently, it was also known by mathematician earlier that the three torus is the only three-dimensional geometry uh, with genus one boundary that has hyperbolic metric in it. So that means that uh, if you consider double branch cover of this rational triangle, you can put uh, hyperbolic metric on it, the anti-metric, anti locally anti-metric over here. But you cannot put the hyperbolic metric on uh, for double branched cover of non-rational tangle. So that seems to be the fundamental reason why you only sum over this gamma too. So, so here, so now we came to the uh, understanding of average of twist operator in the Z2 orbifold case. So in that case, you, uh, you, uh, the average of this correlation function is given by sum over gamma two over Z. Uh, and uh, each one of them can be uh, interpreted as a partition function of solid torus, which is a double branch cover over Z2 vortice, uh, naturally associated to the Chan Simon field. And you sum it, over configuration, and you sum over configuration in such a way that uh, the double branch cover over Z2 vortices can have hyperbolic metrics. So it, that's. Yoshi, can yes. I ask you a question, please? Sure, please. Uh, I, I can understand why it's important that you get the solid torus, but why is it important to get the hyperbolic metric? So, yeah, well, so, so here comes the interpretation. So this, this leads us to a natural interpretation that the bulk dual of uh, 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 this average conformal field theory is a Chan Simon theory gauged with Z2 coupled to topological gravity, which sums over hyperbolic geometries. So that was the case. Uh, in the uh, 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 ARIA work. So, so I, I reviewed their work and they found that uh, the average of the uh, uh, torus conformal field theory has a natural interpretation as a topological Chan Simon gauge theory coupled to topological gravity whose purpose of life is just to sum over hyperbolic geometry. So we found that by uh, you, uh, from this example, we discovered the same rule that uh, if you average correlation function of uh, uh, Z2 orbifold theory, then it is it has a bulk interpretation as a, a partial function. Sorry, uh, the co uh, compu correlation function of Z2 uh, uh, vortices in the Chan Simon theory with Z2 gauging coupled to topological gravity whose purpose of life is to sum over hyperbolic geometry. Well, somebody put something on the chat. Why does topological gravity care about hyperbolic geometry? That's a good question, Jack. I don't know. It's just, uh, this is, uh, so, so, so what I have in mind is something like two, uh, uh, string theory. So in string theory, you can think of as a, a two-dimensional conformal field theory coupled to topological gravity and the purpose of life of topological gravity 
is sum over two dimensional topology. So, so, so I regard this analog of that, where uh, uh, in three dimension, you have uh, 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 three dimension, in, in view of two dimensional conformal field theory, we have three dimensional topological field theory. And in view of summing over two dimensional world sheet, we are summing over three dimensional hyperbolic geometry. So that's sort of the rule that I can deduce from this example. I don't have any fundamental explanation. I'm just trying to deduce rules, patterns uh, out of this example. Jack, am I an answering your question? I'm, I'm yeah, not well, answering I mean, your question, they're, 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 your they're, question. You're, you're, you're summing over topologies that admit a hyperbolic metric. And, I, and I'm, I, I don't sort of understand how topological gravity knows what sort of metrics are admitted by a given topological three manifold. Right, yeah, it's, it's, I, I don't know uh, why uh, I should say, uh, but uh, that, that seems to be the rule uh, in, 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 in their example too. So here uh, the, you can ask the same question. Why do they sum only over solid torus? Because right, but... uh, there, there are various other, many, many, many other geometries, three dimensional sure, geometry, fair. Wh which is bounded by torus, right? Sure, that's fair. But, but, but saying I sum over solid tori, that's a perfectly topological statement. And I can imagine topological gravity well, I have, a, I, have, I have a topological statement, which is sum over rational tangles. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> but that, 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 that doesn't seem interesting. Fair enough doesn't sound like a compliment. And uh, the, uh, the reason is that uh, I think that it's much, so the reason that I prefer this way of stating it is that this seems to be more universal, that it's common to both examples. That is that uh, so somehow three-dimensional gravity theory prefer hyperbolic geometry. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So I don't have any fundamental explanation. I'm just trying to deduce patterns from this data. So you can also generalize it to other of four, ZP of four. This is actually uh, interesting because now you get a, a higher genus surface. So if you have G2 of four, ZP of four, you get the genus P minus one handle body. And uh, uh, if and only if, again, the uh, ZP uh, vortex uh, give rise to uh, rational tangle configurations. And uh, so this can be, there are lots of interesting mass associated to it. I don't, I, I think I'm running out of time, so I should move on. So I would like to tell you a couple of other examples. And uh, so, so one example is K3 and the Caribbean. Um, models. So here it's more challenging because modular space is more, more complicated and uh, the theory is actually interacting, it's not free. But we can try to see whether uh, what we have seen before works uh, in these cases. So first I would like to tell you about the structure of the Hilbert space of this sigma model. So, so here is a passion function. There, there is a vacuum state. So I'm decomposing this uh, passion function in representation of n equal to superconformal algebra, okay? So you have a vacuum representation and you have a, a half BPS state, which in the literature, in the literature of a sigma model is are called CC and AC primary. These are chiral representations and uh, these are chiral in both left mover and right mover or chiral and anti-chiral on left and right. And this part is completely determined by topology. So this is fixed. And then there is a quarter BPS state, which is basically chiral on the left and non-chiral on the right, or chiral on the right and non-chiral on the left. These are the, essentially this passion function is determined by elliptic genus uh, of this uh, sigma model. Uh, there are sort of uh, isolated point in modular space of this uh, sigma model where symmetry gets enhanced and then, then, then you have more quarter BPS state. But generically, uh, this is totally determined by elliptic genus. So this was actually studied in my PhD thesis and uh, this led to the discovery of the machine moonshine. And more recently, Christoph Keller and I uh, used it to give constraint on the passion, uh, modular invariant partial function. And then there is a non-BPS sector. So it is actually only non-BPS sector that depends on the 
a, a sigma model moduli. So if you, for example, average uh, of this partial function on sigma model moduli, then first three one is independent of moduli. So you just get reproduce this part. And then, then you have to do no, no trivial average. So pre, based on the previous example, so in the case of OB forward, uh, we had this observation that you can in, interpret this ensemble average as a sum over SL to the orbit of moduli independent part of the partial function. So you can ask the same question, does, would that work? Would that work uh, in the uh, 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 Carabiel sigma model case? And uh, we can actually show that uh, it, never, it cannot work. Because, uh, so for example, suppose you just average over, you, you sum over uh, a vacuum representation over SL to the orbit, then you can actually prove that uh, if you try to decompose the result in terms of representation of n equal to so Kupa algebra, then you get negative multiplicity. So this is very similar to what happens to the uh, pure gravity theory studied by Maroni and Witten, as uh, I pointed out with uh, Nathan Benjamin, Xiaohe Xiao, and Yifan Wong uh, uh, a couple of years ago. And, uh, but you can say that, well, maybe you, you can try to sum over these uh, three uh, modular independent work, and it does not work uh, for similar reasons. So, so this seems to say that uh, uh, this uh, 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 ensemble average story does not quite work in the same way for K3 and Karabiyao sigma model case. You can also see, uh, ask what happened, or oh, somebody asked questions, so let me open the chat box. So uh, Pedro, could we sometimes have more than a single natural measure to use? Oh, this is an excellent, Question. Yes, yes, yes. So, 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 so far, I assume that we average over, you know, we average using the homological metric, which I thought would be a natural thing to do. But certainly, we may consider averaging. There, there, a priori, there is no reason not to use other me measures. Uh, there are cases when you can consider other measures. So, I don't know. I'm just trying to find out the rules. So, for all before, this seems to work. Now, the, the, the way that this does not work for sigma model, is independent of, it seems to be independent of the measure. The reason that uh, I, I don't like negative multiplicity appearing on the right-hand side is that that would mean that average contains negative. But average should not contain negative because uh, we, are, uh, we are starting with positive definite partial function and we are just averaging it. You shouldn't get the negative uh, multiplicity out of it, provided that we are integrating that over positive definite measure. So, so when uh, Pedro asked, well, uh, could we consider some other measure? So I'm assuming that at least we may restrict our attention to a positive definite measure. And in that case, I think that the, our claim that uh, this naive generalization in K3 and Caribbean case does not work holds even for this large class of uh, measures. That's my answering your question. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now finally, I just briefly want to say about the rational CFT case. So rational CFT case, we have central charge given by this formula. And the interesting thing, thing is that for M greater than five, there are not one conformal field theory, but there are two or three inequivalent conformal field theory. So people classify the modular invariant partial functions, and these are classified by ADE diagrams. So when M is greater than five or equal to five, in addition to A series, you have D series and sometimes E series. So that means that you can ask where well, if you sum over this vacuum function function, can you express that as sum of a conf these conformal field theory with no negative weight? This seems, this works for M less than 13 or equal to 13, but there is a counter example at M equal 14. So this is a very interesting thing. So we, we started looking at it and it works at M equal five, it works for M equal six, seven, eight, nine, 10. So being physicists, we almost decided that it's gonna work forever. But then we went 11, 12, 13, and in 14, it failed. <laughs> so <laughs> so, so, so this, this gives us some lesson about, uh, we should be careful in uh, 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 deriving, uh, sort of guessing some pattern. And uh, uh, 
it seems like uh, there, there may be infinitely many cases where it works, and there seems to be infinitely many cases where it doesn't work. A uh, similar observation was made recently by uh, uh, these three authors, uh, including Sunil Muki, uh, in the context of uh, uh, Bess Zumina Witten model, where there is again similarly uh, cases where you have inequivalent representation with the same chiral algebra. And sometimes the average works, sometimes the work average doesn't work. Okay, so, so, so I promised that I give you some example of this ensemble average, and I gave. So I would like to sort of deduce some guess on what the general pattern is. So one guess that I can offer is that in all the examples we have seen, an ensemble average of two-dimensional conformity theory has a holographic interpretation only if C is equal to critical central charge, C critical, where critical central charge is defined by the asymptotic density of state of the vacuum state. So as you know, if you have a unitary conformal theory, the asymptotic density of state of entire conformal theory is given by Cardi formula and uh, basically controlled by the central charge. You can ask the same question for each irreducible representation of the chiral algebra. And, uh, and then again, you have Cardi-like formula uh, with post, uh, often different coefficients. And so that coefficient is called a C critical, critical central charge. In cases when it works, namely that uh, you, uh, you want to the C, that the torus target space or OB fold, it turns out that uh, central charge is the same as critical central charge. And in cases when it doesn't work, like Carabiao or K3 sigma model, the central charge is strictly greater than critical central charge. And in the case of minimal model or the Suzumino model, actually C is equal to C critical. So that's why I formulated this conjecture as a necessary condition, but not sufficient. So I've been careful about that. Uh, so, so, but th what this suggested is that in order for this ensemble average story should work, it seemed like you have to have sufficiently large symmetry to organize a system. That's what C or C critical means. And uh, so this seems to work only for low dimensional system because it is only in low dimensional quantum system where Symmet at, at, well, at least uh, in, in known cases, like integrable models, where uh, uh, you have sufficiently large symmetry that you can control the all, uh, 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 spectrum of conformal theory. So, so in high dimension, uh, there are not many examples known uh, such, uh, such cases. And so that's maybe one of the reasons why it doesn't work, or at least why we don't know of any example in higher dimension. But this is yet to see. I think that uh, we just started to see some example of where it works, and uh, I'd like to explore this more. So I guess we are still in our near, and uh, thank you for your attention. So thank you very much for this very beautiful talk. And uh, if there are questions. Hi, Roshi. Thanks for a wonderful talk. Because one is trying to define rules. So when you, for example, when you integrate over C equal one, uh, sorry, uh, general C models, which are toroidal co uh, compactifications, they don't all have the same symmetry. There are, for example, points where there is enhanced symmetry. Thank so, you, yes. When you go over the affine algebra, you didn't you didn't care, or you allowed yourself also to integrate over different symmetries. So right, because question, these are major zero, so so it doesn't matter whether you include them or not. Okay, well, I okay. So uh, what I what I wanted to say is that once you committed the crime, uh, or not a crime. Uh, why I might have committed a crime, but I didn't leave any clue. <laughs> Okay, so why not, for example, what, why not use just the central charge as a criteria? Ah, and let's yes, say yes. integrate over both orbifolds and toroidal compactifications. Why should we have two different classes? I yeah, that's an interesting point. Point yes, but in that case, you are regarding Birasoro algebra. You are assigning Birasoro algebra as some distinguished role, right? But here it seems like uh, other chiral algebra seems to be important. For example, the reason you have Chan-Simon theory 
has to do with the fact that uh, this conformal field theory has U1, uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. U1, U1 chiral algebra, U1 to the C chiral algebra. And so if you, cons if you include other conformal field theory with the same central charge, you don't have that symmetry on this side. So, so it seems like uh, uh, yeah. th this violates the spirit of uh, 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 yeah. correspondence between the symmetry. Yeah, you, you have to keep the symmetry. You average only said, about things that have, have the same it. symmetry. Who said I have to keep it? I don't know, uh, but uh, it seems like uh, what I'm just pointing out is that, for example, you could have considered other, uh, including both uh, OB forward and, uh, so for example, Torah's uh, conform theory, but then, so. then, then, then you, you're going to be mixing up on the right side with a different theory with yeah. different symmetries. Yeah, yeah I agree. This That's why I try to present. use the enhanced symmetry as a, allowing me to do that. But of course, there it's measure zero, and here it's not measure zero. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, nice to see you. <laughs> Other comments, questions? Well, I, I would like still to ask in, in terms of, uh, do we really expect if the duality is uh, between a conformal field theory or a field theory and string theory, not just gravity? Do oh, we yeah, really I would love to have an example like that. Yes. No, no, that's what we believe, right? I mean, it's type yeah, so, 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 so here is a. So here is if a, we have a string a, theory, a, do, we really, do we really expect to have some kind of an average on what? What is the I, I do point? not. I do not. So let me tell you a reason. So, so I said that uh, this does not work. So, so, so it looks like uh, from, from what I know that the ensemble average of Carabia sigma model or K3 sigma model does not give you a nice uh, bulk interpretation. But we have an example where non-average uh, sigma model with uh, Carabia target space give rise to holographic dwarfs. But these are, for example, example of uh, ADS3 times S3 times K3 being dual to two-dimensional conformal field theory whose target space is a symmetric tensor product of K3. So there, K3 moduli is fixed, as it has a beautiful bulk dual, which strings and black holes and uh, other things we love. And uh, so it seems like there are two classes of theory, even for given conformal field theory. And in that case, I suspect that if you average over K3 modular space, it doesn't give you a nice bulk interpretation. So I'm offering you another data point where it works without averaging and it gives rise to strings and black holes. Here, you, uh, it works, in this example, uh, it works with average, but it doesn't have strings. So, yeah, but I'd love, love to have some uh, example where you have more non trivial bulk. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Other questions? I, I actually have one. Uh, I understand that you say that you don't expect anything to work for uh, in higher dimension because there's not enough conformal symmetry. But uh, what if I took n equals four, so by a means I took an average over the modulus, would in I get case, anything sensible? Constant, for example. Yeah, would I get anything sensible or not? Um, uh, so that's an interesting uh, point. So, so for example, uh, there is this beautiful uh, uh, work by uh, uh, Waffa and Witten, where uh, uh, the, 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 that, that's, a, that's a paper where they actually uh, I, I found an evidence of, of s duality in uh, uh, n equal four super mirrors by computing some uh, uh, supersymmetric partial mm -hmm. function and found the uh, uh, modular object. So then you would be in, uh, uh, integrating this modular object over, uh, 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 over tau. Mm -hmm. So this is actually very similar in spirit to doing this kind of Narayan average. So, so, so one could, I have not tried, but one could consider averaging this known quantity of uh, n equal four super uh, these observables of n equal four, four super and uh, so I have not done it. That's it might give some meaningful answer. The, the challenge might be that you get a number, so you have to have normalization correct. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, no, because since you seem you, you have a well, way there of is looking a dependence at the right on the time. choice of gauge group. Yeah. So there is a cho dependence on choice of gauge group. So since you, 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 I think you will get some non-trivial. Uh, a function which depends on the choice of 
choice of gauge group. But, uh, yeah, it's be interesting to see whether it has an interpretation. Right, because at least you have an, a, a way of saying that things don't work when you realize that on the right hand side you have negative weights. Essentially. Right, yeah, so, so that was the case for Carabia or Sigma. Right, right. so yeah. maybe there you could at least say it doesn't work, and it's already an answer. Yeah, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't, yeah, it sounds like an interesting thing to look at. Yeah, so, so I, I don't, I have, I don't have any definite reason besides the symmetry reason that uh, that uh, it seems to be difficult to yeah. I think Thank it's you. interesting. Okay, if there are no other urgent questions. I think. We can thank again Hiroshi, at least in our spirit. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very uh, much for, for being with us. Kind invitation, I enjoyed it. Uh, I hope to be able to come back to Florence in person sometime. We hope so. <laughs> and uh, meet other friends there too. Uh, <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you again. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.